सुनील जी जस्ट होल्ड ऑन फॉर अम फॉर सम सेकंड्स ना we are live good evening all welcome to i focus online episode 3 to 9 the fourth in the oculoplasty module today we have with us professor chinmayi from the minto eye hospital and the regional institute of ophthalmology bangalore to speak to us on the upper and the lower eyelid ectropia professor chinmayi to introduce her she finished her mbbs from vims the rajiv gandhi university of health sciences 2004 and completed her ms in ophthalmology from minto ophthalmic hospital she also has a faico from orbit and oculoplasty and currently serves as an associate professor at the minto regional institute of ophthalmology she also is a consultant at the netradama super speciality eye hospital her areas of interest include strabismus orbit oculoplasty neuro ophthalmology and ocular pathology she was awarded the best paper in ocular pathology at aoc 2016 at kolkata she also has to accredit best paper in strabismus at the karnataka ophthalmic state conference 2015 held at dharwad best paper in neuro ophthalmology at the very same conference in 2017 in bangalore she is also corona warrior award by the indian medical association at bangalore 2021 and the second best paper in orbit at opai 2022 Apart from her rich academic experience, she also has an interest in basic and advanced mountaineering course from Himalayan Mountaineering Institute, Darjeeling. She also has a keen interest in music, fine arts, and long distance running. With such a vibrant personality today, we uh, welcome aboard you, ma'am, to please carry on this lecture forward. We are eagerly waiting to hear from you. Thank you. Ma'am, I request you to remove you yourself from the mute uh, setting. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Shikali, Manav uh, sir, and uh, the whole team. So today, I'm. Uh, it's a really a pleasure to be giving this uh, lecture on the eye fo uh, focus series. So uh, when we were PGs, Manav uh, sir started uh, something very similar. and uh, that is when it all started and, and it's really an honor to be here giving this lecture uh, shall i start share my screen sure ma'am please do so the topic for uh, today is the upper and lower eyelid ectropion so this will be uh, with respect to the pathogenesis evaluation and management and uh, this is part of the series which were uh, earlier described uh, the lid anatomy the embryology and ectropion and uh, entropion and today i will be dealing with the ectropion so here we can see a very normal person with a very normal looking eyelids when we call it as normal we mean that the eyelid position should be normal uh the upper lid and the lower lid and the position for the upper lid as we all know just covering the like 2 mm of the upper lid and the lower lid margin just touching here and the punctum actually should not be seen and even at the lateral canthus should be the whole shape is an almond shape okay so that is a normal eyelid and the measurements horizontally it's about 27 to 30 mm vertically it is about 8 to 11 mm so in a case of ectropion since the eyelid is going down or the upper lid is moving up or getting inverted generally palpebral um, aperture uh, widens and with age what happens to our eyelid so you can see a very young child with a very uh, nice and supple skin there is an amount of um, like uh, tight skin while as the patient uh, as the person ages you 
can see how the skin starts and because of this we have to know what are all the skin changes that so with age becoming more uh, stretched it loses the muscle plate the medial and the lateral can all these are undergoing stretching and the, the lower lip comes down and in severe cases patients go on in the topic under the headings of the anatomy surgical anatomy required for surgery the pathophysiology the clinical features and treatment so moving on to the anatomy of the eyelid here is a cadaveric dissection as you can see the eyelid is very very thin you can see that the eyelid is extremely thin and underlying that there is hardly any connective tissue so in the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid the skin is very very thin and many of the cases of the ectropion and intropion we also have to remove part of the excess skin so this is again uh, a case of blepharoplasty that then similarly in uh, ectropion if at all the skin is lax we will be remove the skin and the lid margin so a normal lid margin will be sharp at the posterior aspect so if this is is your eyelashes the posterior margin is very sharp and that is in opposition with the glow and the anterior margin is rounded okay and that is how it has to be but in cases of ectropion the posterior margin which was sharp kind of tends to become rounded so it's hard to restore this posterior margin back to normal but it is important for us to know the normal anatomy again uh, the next layer is the orbicularis uh, in a normal person how do we identify the orbicularis just ask the patient to smile and you can see the bunching up of this orbicularis the most important factor whether a patient goes into ectropion or, or entropion is the tone of the orbicularis muscle so the horizontal lid laxity the skin laxity the tarsal plate uh, which is stretching is common between entropion and ectropion because the agent is same but who is going to develop ectropion and who is going to develop entropion is based on the tone of the orbicularis and in the orbicularis as we know there is a here is the free tarsal which lies just above the tarsal plate and what lies over the septum is the pre septal orbicularis and what lies beyond attaching on to the bone is your orbital part of the orbicularis okay so what happens in entropion is like let's say this is the pre tarsal which is lying against the tarsal plate and this is the ma'am your uh, internet is slightly unstable here we have the bone okay so this, okay are you am i audible ma'am you're audible but it's cutting in between so may probably you can just put your video off so probably that bandwidth will go to the okay. present okay. yeah i guess i'll move yeah because it's uh, slightly breaking yes. in between otherwise it's fine slides are moving fine but your voice is breaking okay. this is breaking okay is it better yes ma'am uh, yeah okay so uh, what what i was telling is that um, when the orbicularis the preceptal orbicularis when it is hypertrophied it overrides the pretarsal orbicularis and if it, the, it is such a situation the patient goes into an entropion but if the tone of the preceptal orbicularis is normal then with gravity the patient goes into an ectropion this is most uh, like a very practical way of thinking so here uh, we got to know the pre tarsal the preceptal and the 
orbital part of the orbicularis. Again, after that is your orbital septum. So all the dissections are in the upper lid. But you can see this very thin layer. So this is the orbital septum. And you can also see the orbital septum, uh, which, which consists of a very, very loose connective tissue. So you can see the septum here. And after that is your tarsal, um, like we have the orbital fat. So the fat also kind of uh, contributes to the ectropion because this fat pushes through the tissue and weakens the uh, layers. So that is another uh, reason. And particularly when we are operating, we might also add a fat removal uh, if the patient is willing. So here uh, is the lower eyelid, uh, which is important because uh, most of our ectropion is going to happen in the lower eyelid. And uh, we are seeing this three fat pockets. Uh, this is the nose. And uh, here we are seeing the inferior oblique muscle going between the two fat pockets. So all this is important for the dissection. You can see the inferior oblique in much more detail. So now moving on to the pathophysiology, as I told, the movement of this orbicularis determines whether it, the patient is going into entropion or an ectropion. The important uh, thing is the orbicularis, which may become weak, the lower lid retractors, which may become weak, and the translaminar connections, which are also becoming weak. So here, uh, if your this is your lid, you know, this is a posterior border. We have the tarsal plate here, okay, and these are the lower lid retractors. We have the uh, inferior oblique, the inferior rectus, and all here. And horizontally, when we take in the lid, so the tarsal plate is here, and uh, this is the medial and your lateral canthal ligament. So here, what are we? Uh, what is the pathophysiology? One is the weakness of this tarsal plate the ligaments, stretched ligaments, then the skin which is weak and the lower lid retractors. So all these are becoming weak and causing the lid to turn outside. So etiology for the ectropion, uh, basically ectropion like we just discussed is the outward turning of the eyelid margin and it primarily involves the lower eyelid. Upper lid eversion is rare and uh, mostly it also includes the term floppy eyelid syndrome, which I will discuss later. The risk factors for developing ectropion are age, basically because of the loss of elasticity and because of gravity. If the preceptal orbicularis is not tight enough, because of gravity, it just falls down. Patient is frequently rubbing the eyelid. That's another reason. Repeated eyelid pulling, the floppy eyelid syndrome, long term use of eye drops. Mostly, your anti glaucoma medications do cause a lot of skin changes and any skin conditions involving the eyelid, trauma, and prior eyelid surgery. The symptoms patients generally come for the abnormal position. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, ma'am, audible. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yeah. So the symptoms are the most important thing is patients themselves realize that their uh, shape of the eyelid is abnormal. That's when they come to us. But most people are uh, having a symptom of urine because the lid is no longer uh, the lid is no longer supporting the eyeball and the water just instead of going into the pumpkin drops down. So they have tearing. And many of the elderly people come with uh, complain that they are not unable to read. Every time they have to keep uh, rubbing uh, or wiping the tears. So functionally, it's affecting them. So even though the abnormal position of the eyelid is not there, the other complaint is tearing. Although the lid is appearing normal in position, but they have tearing because of the lax lid. Irritation, grittiness, and foreign body sensation. And uh, if there is exposure keratopathy or the conjunctival exposure, they have redness of the eye. And uh, secondary to the development of keratinization and all, there can be mucor discharge. Or if there's an infection also, there can be a discharge. And in cases of any paralytic 
type of exocrium, there could be an inadequate lid closure. So the types are uh, the most important is the involutional ectropion. Here, the causes are the increased horizontal laxity of the lower eyelid, the disinsertion of the lower eyelid retractors, and the tarsal ligamentous link, which attaches from the uh, along the orbital rim through these canthal tendons, medial and lateral, has become lax. The next common thing that we generally see is secondary to any kind of trauma. Uh, it could be either a physical mechanical injury or a chemical injury or some cicatrizing diseases, which causes shortening of the anterior lamella, that is the skin and orbicularis. So that's the next common setting that we generally see in our clinic. And paralytic ectropion is also common. So here, the paralytic ectropion, the cause here is the decreased orbicularis muscle tone. And mechanical ectropion, wherein there is a mass uh, or a tumor which displaces the lower eyelid margin. Certain conditions like mid-facial hypoplasia are also a cause for ectropion, which we will discuss later. So in the examination, what are we going to discuss? The facial architecture, uh, particular face, we will, uh, again, I'll show some pictures and we can see into that. Uh, in a Generally, in an involutional entropion or a senile age-related uh, entropion, you can see if, this is the right eye. And in the left eye, you can see that the lower lid margin is not at the touching the limbus. It's slightly down. Okay, So that you can see, this is one of the earliest uh, signs of involutional entropion. More earlier to this is a slight punctal eversion also. That's another uh, thing. So here, the lid is slightly at a lower position in comparison with the other eye. But most often, uh, the condition is bilateral. So here, we check for horizontal laxity. And we do the eyelid distraction test. So how do we do the uh, horizontal laxity? So if, if we are asking, uh, just using the thumb, we just pull the eyelid laterally. And you can see that the punctum is getting pulled way too much. And medially, when you are going to pull, the lateral is not so lax, but the medial camphor tendon is very lax here. In the snap test, what we generally do is pull the eyelid, uh, holding at the center forward. And if it goes back with the snap, it means the tension is good. If it is taking too long to go back, then the, there is a definite horizontal lip laxity and the tarsal plate itself is weak. So when the cases are severe, okay, the initial one, what I showed was very mild. But in cases of severe eyelid ectropion, as in this case, where there's a bilateral ectropion, you can see uh, this is called as a tarsal ectropion because we are able to see the tarsal plate. And here, what we have to observe is that uh, the conjunctiva has, the palpebral conjunctiva has keratinase. So you can see this area here uh, has become kind of keratinized on this part. Can you see this is all the keratinization? This is also the keratinization that you're seeing. And you can also see some amount of mibomian, uh, mibomitis also that is there. And look at the lower lid margin. It, the Whatever lower lid margin that I told, the sharpness of the lower lid margin is lost. Uh, also notice the corneal condition. Because of this long-standing ectropion, even the cornea is compromised. So the, this was a severe ectropion. There is an entity called punctal ectropion. It becomes very relevant because here the rest of the eyelid may not be everted, but the position of the lower punctum has rotated outwards. And it is no longer making a contact with the ocular surface. As you can see in this particular patient, uh, as you see here, the punctum, which was supposed to be opposed to the globe, is now turned outwards. The lid margin, the rest of the thing appears okay, but here uh, even th there is a ectropion uh, along the whole length. 
but this punctal ectropion causes a lot of watering and also notice the mucus discharge, the congestion that this patient has. So why is all this important, whether the, it is from the medial side, whether it is on the lateral side or the whole eyelid is for us to decide what surgery we are going to do. For this particular patient whose punctum is everted outwards, if I do a lateral tarsal strip, he is not going to be happy because the punctal position will not get opposed. The lid position will get proper, but punctal position, we have to do a uh, medial canthoplasty. So here, uh, again, I showed the chronic blepharitis, the conjunctival hypertrophy, keratinization, scarring, and any also keep in mind for any tumors like uh, meibomian cell carcinoma, which is presenting as a chronic blepharitis and all, which uh, has to be kind of uh, ruled out. So in the ocular surface, the cornea changes secondary to the exposure. So this is one more patient uh, who is having a tarsal electropion. As you can see, has landed in an acute corneal ulcer. So these patients are particularly people who are coming from uh, villages. They may have a lot of exposure, keratopathy also, and the lid, which is already turned outwards so much. So here, the treatment will be uh, first the acute treatment of the ulcer and followed by the ectropion treatment. So the differential diagnosis is the eyelid malignancy, eyelid retraction. If there are eyelid retraction like a thyroid eye disease, it, could, it can mimic a ectropion. If uh, following a blepharoplasty, excessive tissue removal, excessive tissue removal, like tumors, particularly lower lid tumors, not excessive, but if it is a wide excision biopsy, you have to remove the uh, lesion. So in those cases, there can be an eyelid retraction. And in squint surgeries, whenever we are doing an eye uh, inferior rectus recession, because the inferior rectus shares the, uh, like the lower lid uh, retractors are attached with the inferior rectus. So if this is your eyeball, and uh, in those cases also, there will be an eyelid retraction. Floppy eyelid syndrome, lamellar ichthyosis, and facial lupancy. These are all the conditions which have to be kept in mind. Uh, this is again a patient with tumor where there can be a little amount of entropion on the lateral side. So management the, is definitely surgical. Okay, So it is always usually surgical for the entropion. The medical management is only temporary uh, till you are awaiting for the surgery. We can give lubricating drops or if the patient has been using some other um, medications, definitely we, can, we can't stop dozolamide or brimonidine, but if any alternatives can be given, that can be given. And if there are inflammatory skin conditions like the ichthyosis, the congenital conditions or eczema of the eyelid, repeated eye, eyelid rubbing. So then also uh, treating that condition will uh, make the skin back to normal and the ectropion can disappear. So in those cases, we wait for surgery. So in the medical therapy, lubrication and horizontal taping is what we do. So surgery, we will discuss as and when we go. The main, uh, the table also I will summarize later. First, we will go ahead with the Uh, in, for the involutional entropion, one of the commonest surgery that we do is the lateral tarsal strip. So here uh, you can see that uh, we are clamping the lateral canthus and then having uh, cutting the lateral canthus. So we have to ensure that the tarsal plate is seen separately and palpating so that the whole of the canthal ligament is cut. So the can lateral canthotomy is an important surgery that everyone has to know, particularly when there is a retrobulbar hemorrhage. It's very, very important. It's a similar procedure. And here, now the tarsal plate is identified. And along the eyelid margin, I'm splitting the anterior and the posterior lamella. So the anterior lamella consists of the skin and the 
orbicularis muscle. So you can see uh, I'm using a 11 number blade. We can also use a 15 number blade. Uh, it works uh, easier with the 15 number blade. So once it is cut, then using a conjunctival scissors, uh, it's easier with the conjunctival scissors. You can separate the anterior lamella. So here, now we can see the skin is separate and this is the tarsal plate. And the lid margin has to be excised. Okay, so that's the lid margin that was excised. And this is the tarsal strip. And this tarsal strip has to be attached to the lateral orbital rim at a slightly higher position because it, it was already lax. So I'm using a non-observable stitch uh, using a proline 50. We can also use a 60 proline. So this we are going to attach and then cut the excess tarsus. The conjunctiva on the tarsal plate can be either uh, removed with uh, scissors or you can also do a slight cauter to uh, is attached. And then you assess the tightness. So you can see that it is now tight. And at the edge, the skin has to be excised as a triangle sutured. The canthus has to be formed by a canthus forming stitch. So that is the end of the procedure. So the common, this is a one common procedure that is done in the involutional entropy. So other procedures are the everting sutures. These are temporary sutures, horizontal lid shortening, lateral tarsal strip I just described, medial canthoplasty, medial conjunctivoplasty, and phonics deepening. So as we know, the everting sutures are generally uh, these are a temporary procedure, okay? Usually temporary procedure. Most of them will eventually go on to need one of the other procedure. Horizontal lid shortening, when do we do? When there is a horizontal laxity, that, that is when your tarsal plate is weak. So that is when we do the horizontal lid laxity. When the canthus, canthal tendons are lax, if it is in the lateral, we do the lateral tarsal strip, when your lateral canthus, canthal tendon is weak, we do the lateral tarsal strip. When the medial canthal tendon is weak, we do the medial canthoplasty. When there is a punctal ectropion, we do, we do the medial can, conjunctivoplasty, that is excision of a diamond-shaped conjunctiva. And the phonics deepening also is a procedure which we do in cases of tarsal ectropion. Okay, so this is a summary of the procedures that are generally done, and we just discussed the lateral tarsal strip. So, in a cases of involutional ectropion, here in this particular patient, as you can see, the there is a downward movement. So, here this patient needs a lateral tarsal strip to pull, pull, uh, put the lateral part back to the normal, and if the horizontal part is uh, also weak, that your tarsal plate, the snap test is also positive, then we also can add a horizontal lid sh shortening. Okay. In cases like this, when there is a severe tarsal ectropion, we have to do a horizontal shortening. Okay. And we also have to put a phonics deepening stitch. And if at all the tarsal uh, lateral canthal tendon is weak or not based on that, we can add that procedure as well. It's it's not like you have to do only one procedure. You can add or delete based on what is the patient's condition. So now I will show you the horizontal um, shortening procedure, which is a very commonly done procedure, wherein the pentagon wedge excision is made. So the tarsal plate full thickness eyelid with the tarsal plate is excised. And then 
the two ends are stitched together. So this is done by a three, five, five, uh, three uh, step wherein uh, I have passed the suture at five millimeter from the lid margin. And that has come out from this raw area, entering through the raw area, through the tarsal plate, coming out at five millimeter away. Again, re-entering the lid margin at three millimeters, coming out of the raw surface. Again, going through the raw surface of the opposite side, coming out at three millimeters. So that is a five, three, three, five number. And it is tightened. Okay, so this way the horizontal uh, excessive length can be shortened. Along with that, the skin has to be excised to match the tightness. We can leave the sutures long so that it doesn't rub on the cornea. Okay, so that is the end of the uh, procedure of the horizontal lid shortening. Again, depending on uh, uh, any uh, punctal problem or anything, we have to add a medial canthoplasty or the medial conjunctival plastic. And in the phonics deepening, uh, we will be doing the phonics deepening stitch as we do it in a, uh, any other socket reconstruction similar to that. So punctal ectropion I discussed, we will be doing a medial conjunctival plasty wherein a uh, like a uh, diamond shape of the conjunctiva is excised. So if this is your punctum here, uh, so just below the punctum, we are going to excise a diamond shape of conjunctiva and then through that, we will be passing the sutures and tightening. So that this punctum is turning inside. So fillers have also been tried in some cases of uh, ectropion. Moving on to the paralytic ectropion, mostly it is in cases of facial nerve palsy. So we have to test the facial muscle strength to assess the type, whether it's an LMN or a human. Here, uh, so you can see definite upper retraction. The lower lid is also down and there is pulling go close. So that is the um, facial nerve palsy causing a paralytic type of ectropion. So in a patient with a, a facial nerve palsy, we have done a medial and uh, a lateral tarsal strip has been done and a medial uh, tarsography has been added. So most of the cases in facial nerve palsies, we also need to tackle the uh, lag of thermos. So it is not just the ectropion alone, but the palpable fissure has to decrease and there should be a lid closure also. So we will be doing tarsography in those cases, a lateral tarsal strip if it is mild, or a tarsal uh, uh, lateral tarsography. So another condition that we have to remember in paralytic ectropion is the Hansen's disease or leprosy. These patients, usually it is bilateral and there are a lot of skin changes. Like this patient, you can see the whole face has a lot of loss of tone and uh, even the lid margin is kind of destroyed. You can see the skin changes also. There's a, and you can see the medarosis, both the eyebrow and eyelid medarosis. So additional changes are also there. You have to uh, see for Hansen's, particularly when there is bilateral ectropion and bilateral lag of thermos. Many of them also have this kind of severe uh, changes in the um, limbs, the low, lower, uh, the toes are missing, um, self amputation of these uh, digits. So in these cases, generally we prefer to do a permanent tarsography. The next common uh, type of ectropion is your cicatricial ectropion. Following injury, as in this patient, there is a scar in this part. And this scar is pulling the lid down. 
So in most cases of cicatricial ectropion, we have to release the scar and add skin graft to correct this ectropion. We will see some cases of ectropion. So this particular patient, uh, you can see the upper lid cicatrization here. And actually this patient was a victim of road traffic accident and he had some lid uh, repair done at, as an emergency at a primary center and he was on ventilator for one month. And when he presented to us, you can see how the cornea is already perforated. So for this particular patient, a skin graft was done and later day, he also underwent a keratoplasty and uh, you can see the nice lid closure with skin graft. What I want to highlight in this particular case is that um, the upper lid cicatricial ectropion is very dangerous as the upper lid is the major uh, part for the corneal protection. So it has to be dealt very urgently. Uh, very bad cases of facial burns. Uh, again, in this particular patient also, she had uh, some tumor removed elsewhere and the skin graft was done uh, somewhere else. And you can see the cornea is also got affected and we put in another skin graft for her. So this is another case of lower lid ectropion following injury. Upper lid ectropion, again, following some chemical injuries. You can see both eyes, cornea is affected, and the left eye is the better eye for this person. So here we have uh, released the upper lid scar tissue and put in a skin graft for him. And this is how the patient looks immediate post-operative period. You can compare the lid closure that is improved. Okay, so here one important thing in skin grafts for a cicatricial ectropion is to release all the adhesions. So the adhesions have to be released. You have to feel more than uh, seeing it is of feel because you are you are, once you move your finger along the lid, you will see the tightness. So tight bands. So all the bands have to be released. And that's when uh, actually we need a large amount of skin for that. So you are in this post burn patient, you can see that once you release all these bands, look at the amount of skin that we need. So usually this skin is not enough uh, from your uh, regular uh, thing like uh, post auricular may be sufficient for this patient, but it won't be sufficient for the lady. So many a time we use skin from uh, near the inner arm or the supraclavicular area because we need a fairly large amount of skin and you also need it bilaterally. So those are the uh, cicatricial ectropion which are managed by a very large skin grafts. Other causes of cicatricial ectropion um, could be with post tumor removal and generally we tend to wait in these cases for some time and then you could add skin. Uh, another case that we generally see in children is the lamellar ichthyosis. Luckily, in these patients, although it looks very bad, the cornea is relatively preserved. Uh, it is a little difficult to treat these cases as there is no normal skin available for the child, even including the uh, flexural areas. Everywhere the ichthyosis is there. Uh, so amniotic membrane grafting or maternal skin is the thing that could be considered in these. Uh, lastly, we are almost coming to the end of this session. Uh, I'm just wanting to touch on some other rare causes of ectropion, like the floppy eyelid syndrome. Like this newborn baby which presented to us with the uh, floppy eyelid syndrome, uh, as in this uh, severe upper eyelid tarsal ectropion. And as you see, even the right eyelid is edematous. And because of this, even chemosis can develop. So how do we treat these uh, floppy eyelid syndrome? It's just uh, wait and watch. Most of these are self-limiting. You have to constantly reposit the eyelid and generally they resolve quickly. So the important thing in the floppy eyelid syndrome is the lower lid, which is uh, if they are not in opposition, the upper eyelid and the lower eyelid are not in opposition. The, lo the lower eyelid rides high and the upper eyelid sits over it. So that is demonstrated here in this particular. The lower eyelid is going under 
the upper eyelid is coming over and this is the same child after a few days uh, uh, after a week uh, once we kept on repositing for three to four days and even the chemosis the edema everything uh, resolved and uh, uh, having a normal looking conjunctiva uh, the last thing that i want to discuss is the cases of this mid facial hypoplasia as you can see in this syndrome like child like many of his krausen syndrome and other uh, pierre robin syndrome and other syndromes where there is a mid facial hypoplasia the mid face uh, here like generally when we have we, we will be having a um, forehead then we have the nose like this and so here the there is a malar prominence but in the mid facial hypoplasia this malar prominence is lost and the Malar prominence is behind the eyeball. In the lateral gaze, you can appreciate it better. And these cases land up in uh, ectropion and sometimes even uh, proptosis also, even the uh, spontaneous luxation of the globe as well. So for this particular child, uh, we, we have already done skin graft for the child when he was very young because there was exposure keratopathy. And this is a second stage procedure done on one eye first wherein we have added more skin. You can see the, again, we need a large amount of skin on this cell. And now uh, we have finished the, all the types of the uh, ectropion. And I just want to summarize what all we learned today. So if the ectropion, uh, when we have involution, we can have paralytic we can have secretory skin. And other rare things like the last few that I discussed, that's your floppy eyelid syndrome and these cases of midfacial hypoplasia. So those are very, very rare. And uh, floppy eyelid is generally weight and uh, reposit the tissues. And midfacial hypoplasia is difficult, uh, needs multiple stage surgery. So the easiest, uh, like the most simpler thing, I mean, simpler in this thing, decision making only, secretory electropion is mainly because of shortening of the anterior lamella. Since it has become short, you lengthen it. Okay. Whatever was short, we have to lengthen. So here, we, the treatment is scar release. We have to release the scar and add skin. Okay. So that is in cases of psychiatric cell ectropion. Now the involutional and the paralytic uh, ectropion are similarly treated, except that whenever there is a paralytic squint uh, and there is a lot of lag of thalamus, a tarsorophy has to be added. So either a tarsorophy or any other Procedure like gold weights, uh, Botox, those are all the other things. So basically, we have to also look into the aspect of lid closure in paralytic ectropion. So now we are left with the involutional ectropion and the paralytic ectropion without the uh, eyelid closure issues. So in those cases, how, what surgery are we going to uh, do? So whenever there is a horizontal laxity, okay. So whenever there is a horizontal laxity, we will be doing a one second. I'll just erase everything. So we are only discussing the involutional entropy. Okay. So involutional again we discussed. Uh, we will be doing the uh, horizontal laxity. We will be testing for the horizontal laxity. If there is a lateral cancel laxity. Lateral canthal laxity. Then you have a medial canthal laxity. Then you have the horizontal, entire horizontal lid laxity. That is meaning the tarsus has become weak. Okay. And then you have punctal issue. Okay. So when there is a punctal issue, we are doing medial conjunctivoplasty. That is the rhomboid shaped excision of the conjunctiva. When there is a horizontal lid laxity, what we are going to do is the pentagon excision and 
the phi three three phi sutures. That is five millimeters away from the lid margin. Coming out, going through, coming out five millimeters away. Again, coming three millimeters out of the and suture. So that is the wedge excision and vertical mattress stitch for for the horizontal laxity involving the tarsus. For the medial canthal laxity. We will be doing a medial canthoplasty where we are hitching the medial palpebral ligament to the bone. In the lateral canthal laxity, what we are doing is the shortening of the horizontal uh, lateral tarsus and attaching it to the bone, to the orbital bone. So that is the lateral tarsal strip, LTS. Okay, medial canthoplasty, horizontal lid shortening, and uh, medial conjunctivoplasty in very severe cases of tarsal ectropion. So, that is a rare situation when you have tarsal ectropion, we do conics deepening stitch. Okay, so that pretty much summarizes the different uh, types of surgeries we discussed. So the most important uh, thing is that uh, what we, uh, just give me one minute, please. Okay. So the main, most important thing is to know the anatomy properly, because once you know the anatomy, uh, the surgery becomes a lot more easier. And in the anatomy, mainly, all our incisions are going to be four millimeters below the lower lid margin when you are doing any full thickness surgery to avoid the palpable arcade. And it is important to identify the lower lid retractors. Uh, yeah, I also forgot to tell the attachment of the lower lid retractors. So that is in your inverting sutures and uh, uh, inverting sutures. And also, whenever there's a retractor laxity, we can attach the lower lid retractors to the uh, tarsal conjunctiva. So knowing a proper anatomy and uh, proper examination to assess what factor is a problem, whether it is only the horizontal or the medial or the lateral, what about the punctum? So because based on this examination, we have to choose our surgery. And again, uh, choosing the proper procedure for each patient. If patient has lateral canthal tendon laxity and we do just horizontal lid laxity, it doesn't help. So choosing the right procedure for the patient. And uh, the more other important thing is to not to miss other diagnosis, particularly the corneal. So if there is any corneal involvement, or any other systemic condition, all those things have to be tackled. So that's it about the procedure. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much, ma'am, for such a detailed lecture. Uh, we also have a lot of questions coming in for you from the social media portals. If you're okay with it, shall we just proceed with the questions, ma'am? Yeah, just uh, go and uh, just let me know if the um, internet is still unstable. I Block the video. All right. Okay. Um, are we okay to go ahead? Yes, yes, please. All right, all right. Ma'am, uh, the first question is, how do we manage a case of congenital ichthyosis? Yeah, so these congenital ichthyosis, as I showed you, uh, most of the cases, uh, generally the corneal involvement is uh, not so much. Like compared to the patient's profile, the picture, the, con uh, the cornea is relatively, uh, that's what I have seen. 
but some of the times when uh, there is a lot of exposure as i told like we have to search for a normal skin on the child most often uh, the flexural areas the either the elbow or somewhere near the neck or behind the ear if there is some good amount of skin we can use it but most patients e even those cases are affected so the maternal skin is one thing and then am amniotic membrane is another thing that is discussed uh, some people have tried the hyaluronic fillers and other things to expand the skin i do not have any personal experience in that most of the cases which i have seen uh, like although the face appears bad they don't have so much exposure so medical management is something that we stress a lot and uh, frequent follow ups to see when it is decompensating Um, also, it would be great if you could slightly elaborate on the medical management for our postgraduate students uh, regarding management of congenital ichthyosis. The congenital ichthyosis, yeah. The medical so, management. So, uh, it is similar to any other ectropion, also. Like uh, whenever the patient wants to decide for surgery or the patient is unfit for surgery, generally we want uh, a lot. The mainly the main issue is corneal protection. we want lubrication to happen so we will advise them to use lubricating drops every hourly or so as the need is and uh, definitely lead taping so at least at night uh, also particularly in the paralytic ectropions we ask them to tape the eyelid at night time so that uh, there is uh, no exposure when the patient is in deep sleep and uh, if at all they are using any other medications which is causing these uh, skin changes you have to try and identify what is causing those and if those can be stopped and particularly because the, there is a lot of watering and um, it comes on the skin many patients have uh, skin changes which are there on the and it it is adding on to the ectropion so giving them some uh, deep moisturizing creams uh, taking care not to uh, have this cream enter into the eye also helps in making the skin supple and ready before you plan for the surgery now is there anything else that uh, you guys feel to be added in the medical management thank you um, may i request dr amritika to kindly opine on this ah uh, no i think i completely agree with uh, dr chinmay here we usually follow the same procedure um it is it is a difficult situation because um as ma'am uh, said that it is difficult to find skin for surgical correction in these patients but medically this is what we generally follow especially when they are not suitable for surgery All right, ma'am. Point well taken, ma'am. Uh, maybe move on to the next question, ma'am. Yes, yes, yes. Ma'am, uh, what are the practical challenges faced in management of a paralytic ectropion? Let us say a case of Bell's palsy. What are the challenges do we expect in the surgical management of the same? Okay, so Bell's palsy. The one thing is like uh, uh, earlier days, patients were uh, like mostly. Uh, we used to do the lateral tarsography and uh, medial tarsography, and that was it. But uh, cosmetically, it's a little very disfiguring for the patient. So there are some other procedures also which we tried, like a sling, uh, which like a silicone sling, which can be attached uh, from the medial to the lateral. We can also do the temporal fascia graft. We can harvest the temporal fascia. rotate it here and uh, put it across the two upper and lower so these are other facial reanimation surgeries which can be actually considered uh, for the patients with the paralytic ectropion so here it's not just the ectropion that we are dealing we are dealing the patient as a whole there is also mid facial weakness so all those things have to be handled and if the uh, again we will not go in to the lag of thalamus part but paralytic ectropion as such when we see there is absolutely no tone uh, in the muscle like the entire thing is very very lax so some of these patients do actually need a uh, sling to be done wherein you actually pull the whole uh, lid up or even the entire mid face has to be lifted up 
Uh, is that what you were uh, expecting or anything uh, different? Uh, no, ma'am, not really. I think that answers the uh, query asked by the audience. Um, the next question nine is, uh, what precautions do we take while performing upper eyelid blepharoplasty to prevent an ectropion postoperatively? Yeah, so the uh, with respect to blepharoplasty, the upper eyelid is a lot more forgiving than the lower eyelid. So since in particularly the lateral part of the lid, like, uh, this part, even if you are removing more, uh, doesn't really cause a lot of significant function functional problem. See, cosmetic is a completely different entity, but functional problem is closer to the punctum, through near the upper and the lower punctum, and more so with your lower punctum. That's when uh, the problem is more. And uh, particularly when we are dealing with the lower lid blepharoplasty, uh, usually we proceed with the upper lid first and then the lower eyelid, and we would have removed a lot of skin on the upper eyelid. So there is a tendency to also remove some amount of skin on the lower eyelid. So in the lower eyelid, particularly closer to the punctum, even a small excess skin removal can cause a punctal uh, ectropion. So lower eyelid, I would uh, say be extremely cautious. Even I, I also had some cases in the beginning and I realized that. And in the lower eyelid, I am very, very conservative uh, with respect to the skin fixation. And uh, like you can always redo if the patient is not happy, but uh, excess removal is not uh, warranted, particularly in the lower eyelid and more so near the medial uh, part, just below the fountain. And uh, another thing is the fat also, like uh, how we are cauterizing the fat. Sometimes these fat globules, like uh, they melt uh, when we are using the cautery. And uh, like generally how they describe in the squint surgery, the fat adherence syndrome, like these fat globules can attach to your surrounding structures and also cause some contraction. So whenever you have cauterized the fat, uh, give a thorough wash so that these fat globules are washed away and they don't add on to the contracture which may develop. All right now. Um, Ma'am, the next question is uh, in the when do we decide upon operating versus non-operating in a case of an ectropion, lower lid ectropion? Okay, so actually this uh, is mainly not the doctor's dilemma. It's usually the patients who actually put us in such a situation. Like uh, when we advise them surgery, they don't want to get it done. So it is usually, usually surgeons have a clear idea now whether this is a surgical case or a non-surgical case. So generally, I feel ectropion is a surgical thing only unless uh, it's very, very uh, little and the patient's expectations are very high. See, most of the time, if the patient's complaint is watering uh, and not the ectropion per se, uh, these patients are very, uh, it becomes very difficult to uh, treat their problem because they are worried about watering and whatever we do, whatever we do, the conjunctivoplasty, horizontal tightening, everything, uh, the person is aging and the tone cannot be got back. So those are some of the patients which have, we have to be wary. Definitely, uh, I advise to those patients that you will get 50% reduction in your, uh, around 50% reduction in your uh, problem, but it is hard to get back you to a position you were 20 years before. We can make you some 10 years before, but not so much. So those situations, uh, ten, uh, counseling is very, very important. But otherwise, mostly uh, for the ectropion, medical management as such is only a temporary uh, stopgap solution till we uh, in, uh, land, I mean, convince the patient to go in for any particular surgery. Uh, thank you so very much, ma'am. That's all we have for you tonight. And I hope that if all the other students who would listen to your lecture over the weekend or prior to the examinations and if um, they have a questions pertaining to the topic they might just reach out to you uh, and then you might just help them out with their queries 
before we conclude for today, I have a small announcement to make. We meet next on the 16th of August, the topic being lab of thalmos, etiologies, evaluation and management by Dr. Surya Snata Rath. If you're free, ma'am, please join in. Yeah. Hope you have a great time and we also learn from you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure uh, being part of my focus. Thank you very much. Likewise to have you on the platform as well. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Thank you.